All right, we're looking at Matthew 24, the tribulation, the greatest uh, tribulation in the world, never to be exceeded. Matthew 24 to 26, 24, verse 26. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, the Messiah, do not go out from your protective place of hiding. Or here he is in the inner rooms, and do not believe in it. <clears throat> So from the word of God, written centuries ago, to individuals living in the end times, the Lord Jesus leaves a message he gave the disciples who asked about these tribulation times and what will be the signs. He's telling them in the future how they can specifically act in order to save their physical lives from early physical death. Do not come out of your protected hiding place when anyone tells you there he is out in the desert or here he is in the inner rooms, but instead wait until the true Lord himself comes. Tribulation saints are to watch for the signs of our Lord's coming. It might be pretty evident in those days, which we're not here yet. If you read scripture, you got seven years. So you can figure out when he's going to come. <clears throat> for as lightning comes, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be co the coming of the Son of Man. We go back to Rome, uh, Romans, Matthew 24, 3, a review of verse studied earlier, was shed some light on Matthew 27, 24, 27. So what will be the true sign of your coming, the disciples asked. The disciples being Jews and totally uninformed about the mystery of the rapture in the church, only had our Lord's parousia, his appearance in mind, his second coming, to establish his reign on the earth. So our Lord specifically answers their question about the signs accompanying his second coming. So verse 24, 7 says, You who are still living during the tribulation time, which they are not, the disciples, don't look for the Lord to come into or from a limited area, such as an area in the desert or inside a room in a building. Our Lord's coming will be miraculously visible everywhere on earth. Like lightning is visible everywhere on the earth, so the glory of our Lord's coming will be that much more visible everywhere on the earth. I don't know if I looked at Joel chapter 2, uh, which has a, a specific details provided for this. Acts 1, 9 and 11 also. After he, Jesus, said this, he was taken up before the very eyes, his ascension, and a cloud hid him from their sight. The angels then said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sun? This same Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. Everybody will be able to see him approach from heaven. <clears throat> Revelation 1.7 Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, <clears throat> even those who pierced him, the Jews of the tribulation period who represent those in ancient days who had our Lord crucified. And all the peoples who are unbelievers of the earth will mourn because of him. The judgment they know that he brings. So shall it be. Amen. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2, I think it's 32. Joel 2, 32 says the same thing. I don't, I don't dare go over there because I may not be able to get back. This computer is a little uh, funny that way. Matthew 24, 28 and Luke 17, 37 compared. <clears throat> Wherever there is a carcass, there will be vultures gathered. There will vultures gather. Another sign which indicates that our Lord is imminently due to the, on the scene of the earth for his parousia, his appearance, will be the devastating and unimaginable amount of human carnage, death, all over the earth. A third and a third of the population will die. Billions will be dead. This will not be just symbolic of an earth gone dead with sin, but an actual reality which will stun the sense of many who remain alive after all of God's wrath continues to pour out on a rebellious mankind. Luke puts this verse in a more complicated, completed context. Luke 17, 30 to 37. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. It will be like the destruction of Sodom. Luke 17, 28 to 29. That's what we're referring to. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside shall go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life 
will preserve it. We'll preserve it by submitting to the sovereignty of Christ, to of God, to his plan of salvation, and then to his discipleship, a person living during the tribulation period, and even now will preserve his life from early physical death. The physical life of those who become believers and then those who remain faithful under our Lord's sovereignty, losing their lives in the sense of insubmission to his plan for their lives, will be preserved throughout this tribulation period. And even now, <clears throat> unfaithful believers will lose their lives before the second coming. The unfaithful believer who acts out of his own flesh to preserve his own life, never having trusted in Christ for salvation or direction, will lose his life. Many at the time of our Lord's second coming. What a shame they're so close to that. It's qualifying to be in the millennial kingdom. But they'll die early. But they'll go to heaven with the loss of vast amounts of eternal rewards. I tell you, on that night of the Lord's return and second coming, two people will be in one bed, and one will be taken to die physically, and the other left on the earth to live into the millennial rule. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. The one that's left is the faithful one. Most people misunderstand these passages. The one who is the unbeliever will be taken and physically killed and sent to the lake of fire, and the other who will be survive, a surviving faithful believer will be left to live on into the millennial rule. Now here's the key to the context of this passage in the next verse. <clears throat> Where, Lord, they asked. They asked previously this in verse 35. Where will the one who is taken be taken to, the disciple asked. And Jesus replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Those that are taken will be taken and slain. Therefore the earth will be literally, literally be filled with millions of dead, rotting human carcasses, food for the vultures. Matthew now gives a tremendous visual scenario of the precise moment of the whole world, <clears throat> all of mankind, both dead and alive, has been anticipating. This will be the most momentous event of all time. Immediately after the distress of those days, in other words, immediately after all this tribulation wrath that God has poured out upon the earth, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Luke 21, 25 to 26. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity and at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the earth. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. <clears throat> Revelation 6, 12 to 14. I watched to see Jesus Christ opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So truly God's word is true down to the smallest point in Scripture. Look at Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, Jesus Christ, is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn, protocos, prototokos. Firstborn, translated, refers to priority position rather than of origin. Psalm 89, 27. So firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created for him and by him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Note that in him all things hold together. All things, every single molecule, atom, particle, energy, mass, light beam, etc., in the universe is held together moment by moment by the great God of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> this includes his absolutely sovereign control of every particle and fiber of your own personal being. Such unimaginable power demonstrated in his second coming will shake the hearts of rebellious man and cause him to faint someone to death. <clears throat> So immediately, 24, 29 of Matthew, after the distress of those skies, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So compare how the prophet Isaiah described the events of the world leading to the coming of the Messiah. Even then, in Old Testament times, 
we, they all were advised in those days. Well, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. <clears throat> See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The Bible repeats itself on these things. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. <clears throat> Even more in Isaiah 34, all the stars of the heavens will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall, fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. For the Lord has a day of vengeance and a day of retribution to, to uphold Zion's cause. Luke reports what our Lord said about events leading up to a second coming as well. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So at his second coming, the Lord Jesus Christ is in his absolute sovereignty as God, has withdrawn just a small amount of his power from every corner of the universe, and look what is happening. Heavenly bodies are shaken. Stars literally fall from the sky, probably meteor showers. Somehow the sky recedes like a scroll and rolls up, and the sun literally goes dark. The heavens tremble and the whole earth, the whole moon turns blood red and does not give its normal light. Every mountain and island removed from its place and the sea will roar and toss uncontrollably, and the earth will literally shake from its place, be shaken out of its orbit and its axis. MacArthur states, Jesus here describes the heavenly setting of his appearance. The whole universe will begin to disintegrate, apparently with great rapidity. And during that time, the powers of the heavens will be shaken by Jesus Christ, the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. This is not just something that's uh, poetry, this is literal. Just as he created everything and without his full sustaining power, gravity will weaken and the orbits of the stars and the planets will fluctuate. Astronomers can predict coming stellar events centuries in advance only because of the absolute consistency of the divinely ordered and uniform laws that control the operation of the stars and the planets. But when the Lord withdraws the least of his power from the universe, nothing in it will function normally and every aspect of the physical world will be disrupted beyond imagination. All the forces of energy, here called powers of the heavens, which hold everything in space constant, will be in dysfunction. The heavenly bodies will careen, helter-skelter throughout space, and all navigation, whether stellar, solar, magnetic, or gyroscopic, will be futile because all stable reference points and uniform natural forces will have ceased or else become unreliable. And then the Son of Man will appear. He's the Son of Man and the Son of God. So at Matthew 24, 30, At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The Son of Man is, is, occurs in num numerous passages and is used in Scripture meaning God the Son, the whole second person of the triune God, in his role as the representative man in his perfect humanity with respect to his mission, his death and resurrection, and his second coming. Daniel 7, 13 to 14, we see, In my Daniel's vision at night, I looked, and there before me was the one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, clouds and angels. He approached the Ancient of Days, a special name for God, the Father, and was led into his presence. So clouds could be uh, angels, angelic beings. Daniel 7, 9, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. Only God is to be worshipped. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Since only God himself is eternal in essence, then one who reigns over an everlasting kingdom and who gives eternal life, the Son of Man, must be God himself. It is in the name of the Son of Man in which universal judgments is committed to him, are committed to him, and in man 
and in him is fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of blessing and salvation. More on this next time.